If you're on a hunt for a great wildlife zoom lens that will elevate your photography and give you those amazing images in the field, I'm sure Sony's 200 to 600, Canon's 200 to 800, and Nikon's 180 to 600 mm lenses will be right on top of your list. For years, Sony has dominated the scene with their exceptional 200 to 600 mm lens, but things have finally changed with Canon and Nikon stepping up their game and adding their own mega zooms to the lineup. But don't be fooled by the quite similar sounding specs on paper. There are serious differences between these lenses. I've spent countless hours with these lenses in the field and discovered many things that I love, and then there's a few things I didn't like as much. So let's dive in and see what each of these lenses has to offer and if there's a clear winner. When we look at these three lenses side by side, we can quickly see that they're quite similar when it comes to size and weight. However, when it comes to the design, we can see that the Sony and Nikon lens are very similar, whereas the Canon lens is a bit of an outlier, offering us an extra 200 millimeters of reach and an external zoom design. To have an extra 200 millimeters available, but still keep the lens fairly small in size and similar to the two other lenses, Canon had to use a slower f-stop on the long end. Price-wise, all three of these lenses are quite attractively priced at just under 2000 US dollars, with the Sony lens being the most expensive and the Nikon lens being the most attractive price-wise. None of these lenses is in the top of the line lens range for their respective brand, which isn't a problem, but it means that if you compare these lenses to the top of the line, like G Master S line or L lenses, there will be certain areas where these zoom lenses slightly lack. But then again, these higher end lenses also cost up to five times as much, so there better be a difference if you're paying that much. When it comes to the weight and size, all these lenses are still very hand holdable and lie quite nicely in your hand, but if weight is a concern for you and you intend to handle these lenses for extended period of time, they can feel heavy after a few hours. And there's other options like most 100 to 400 millimeter lenses or 100 to 500 millimeter lens that's definitely a lot lighter and smaller. So if weight is a real big concern for you, this might not be the ideal lens range, but for most people handholding these lenses should, shouldn't be a problem even for an extended period of time. The biggest difference between the three lenses is definitely the design. Nikon's and Sony's lens are an internal zoom design that means whenever you zoom in or out, the lens will stay exactly the same size. Whereas Canon's lens is an external zoom design that means whenever you're zooming towards the 800mm mark, the lens will get longer and longer. Personally, I don't mind the external zoom design, but it's definitely nicer and easier to use an internal zoom, and you're also less likely to get dirt into your lens when you're zooming in and out. If I had to pick my favorite of the three designs for photography, I would have to pick the Sony lens, simply because it lies very nicely in your hand and the zoom ring is also positioned in a very good spot. And the best thing about it is you can use your thumb and you can zoom from 200 to 600 millimeters without hardly moving your fingers. So that's really nice and makes it super easy and fast in the field to use the lens, especially for instance for birds and flight where you quickly want to zoom out and then back in. Whereas on Canon's lens, it basically feels like an eternity to zoom all the way out to 800 millimeters and definitely takes much longer and much more effort compared to the other two lenses. Sony's lens also has by far the best manual focusing. It's nice and big and rubbery and can be easily reached with a few of your fingers. So manually interfering with the autofocus is done quite easily. On Canon's and Nikon lens, we have a rather small, let's call it multifunction ring, which is rather narrow and hard plastic. And you can either assign that to be the manual focus ring or control ring. So not having a large dedicated manual focus ring is something that I don't quite like about the design of those two lenses. And on the Canon and Nikon lens, the, these manual focus rings or multifunction or control rings are also rather set back on the camera. So you have to kind of reach back with your thumb to actually be able to manual focus. Sony's lens, on the other hand, doesn't have a control ring at all. So none of these lenses actually has a design where you have a manual focus ring and a control ring. While for photography, I definitely love Sony's super short and fast throw. I find it almost too fast and too loose for video work. And in that case, the Nikon lens probably offers the nicest compromise. It's still short enough to quickly zoom in and out when it comes to photography, but at the same time, it's not as loose as the Sony throw. So if you slowly want to zoom in or out, it's a little bit easier and nicer to you. So when it comes to the design, the internal zoom design of Sony and Nikon is definitely what I would prefer, with the Canon lens still being good, but definitely a bit more tricky to use in the field. And the strangest thing about Canon's lens is that you cannot remove the rather bulky lens collar and lens foot. 
it always stays on the lens like this. And if you actually want to use the lens on a tripod, you have to add an extra Arca Swiss style lens plate to that already big and bulky lens foot to actually be able to attach it to a tripod head. On the Nikon and Sony lenses, on the other hand, you can detach the lens foot easily and replace it with an Arca Swiss replacement foot, for instance. So you don't actually have to add an extra lens plate to the bottom of these lenses, or you can also remove the lens foot if you don't want it at all, or to make it easier for travel. So while Canon's external zoom design leaves something to be desired at times, especially when it comes to zooming in and out quickly in the field, it does make up for it by offering an extra 200 millimeters on the long end. This is something the other two lenses simply cannot offer and to get to that 800mm range with the other two lenses you will have to add a teleconverter which then adds extra cost, a loss of light and also added weight to your setup. If we're adding the 1.4 extender to the Sony and the Nikon lens, both of these lenses will then be wide open at f9 and have a focal length of up to 840mm. Very similar to the Canon lens being wide open at f9 and 800mm. At 600mm, the Sony and Nikon lens have an advantage though because both of these lenses are wide open at f6.3, whereas the Canon lens is wide open at f8 and 600mm. So in most situations when you have decent light, this doesn't really make a difference, but when you're shooting in low light for instance, having the ability to open up your lens a little bit more to that f6.3 mark can definitely make your life a little bit easier and means you might not have to use crazy high ISOs. When it comes to the background blur, all of these lenses do a quite similar and fairly decent job. Of course, there are no f4 prime lenses that give you a super smooth out of focus background, but they still deliver very pleasant and nice to look at backgrounds. Ultimately, what will your background look like will actually depend on how close you're to your subject and how distant the background is behind your subject. So if you're trying to photograph a small bird in a really busy tree, you will never get a nice and smooth background even with an f2.8 lens. But if you're somewhat close to your subject and there's a nice distant background behind it, you can easily get nice and smooth backgrounds with almost any lens. And no matter what lens you're using, it's important that you learn image editing because you will get better result and you get them faster and you will be much more confident when it comes to the whole editing process and have more fun in the end. And I would love to help you get better results with your raw files, with my Pro Sets, my Masterclass and my Brush Pack. With my Pro Sets, I allow you just one click to transform your raw files. And in my Masterclass, I teach you everything you need in Photoshop to get fantastic results step by step so you can follow along. And with my Brush Pack, I make certain things in Photoshop that much easier for you. So if that's of interest to you, make sure to check this out down there in the description. Having the ability to zoom all the way to 800 millimeters without adding a teleconverter may sound insignificant, but it's actually one of the main reasons that I'm using the Canon lens regularly. Having those extra 200 millimeters available on the long end without having to do anything else is definitely what sets this lens apart from the competition. Of course, you can add the teleconverters to the other lenses and also get to 800 millimeters, but we cannot forget the fact that you can also add a teleconverter to the Canon lens, and then that gets you up to 1120 millimeters with the 1.4 extender attached. And even though they are then wide open at f13, so somewhat limited when it comes to low light shooting, you can still get fantastic images with that combo and that makes the lens super flexible. So if you're after maximum reach and flexibility, it's kind of hard to see past that Canon lens because it just gives you that extra reach on the long end that's definitely hard to come by with most other lenses. On the wide end, the Nikon 180-600mm lens has that 20mm difference, so you can shoot a little bit wider, but ultimately in the field the difference between 180 and 200 millimeters is not super large. One thing we have to remember with these zoom lenses is that they all suffer from something called focus breathing. So if you're shooting next to a 600mm prime lens, these zoom lenses, at least closer to the minimum focusing distance, will all appear to have a shorter focal length. So the 600mm prime lens will have a much larger subject in the frame if you're shooting close to the minimum focusing distance. What definitely stands out about all three of these lenses is the amazing flexibility you have with them in the field. You can take nice and wide shots and also then zoom in all the way to 600 or 800mm to take some nice portraits of the same subject. The autofocus on all three of these lenses is quite good and accurate and definitely fast enough to even shoot some fast moving birds in flight or action. I've taken many flying birds over the years with these lenses and never really had any issues. Of course, from time to time you might have some autofocus images where the autofocus didn't quite hit the subject or slightly jumped off, but 
Overall, the performance has been very good. It was never a concern for me that I feel like with these lenses, I don't get the same or good autofocusing performance compared to much more expensive lenses. So when it comes to the autofocus, I'm definitely happy with it and they work quite well in the field. Keep in mind that that autofocusing performance also heavily depends on what camera we pair the lens with. So for instance, with Canon, you will get much better autofocusing performance on like an R5 or an R6 Mark II compared to an R7. With an R7, the autofocus tends to slightly jump on and off at times. The same is true for Sony and Nikon. If you pair it with an A1 or Z8, you will get better autofocusing performance compared to a Z6 Mark II or an A7 III. When it comes to the overall autofocus and performance, I might get an ever so slight edge to Canon, not necessarily because it checks better, but because it's the easiest to set up and will give good results to most people quite quickly. On top of that, good autofocusing systems are also already available in quite cheap cameras like the R7 or the R8, whereas with Nikon especially, you have to look at much more expensive cameras to get that sort of peak autofocusing performance that can mainly be found at least currently in the Z8 and the Z9. And if you guys want to set up your camera to get the best possible autofocusing results, make sure to check out my videos and my PDF guides down there in the description that will help you to set up your autofocus for success. Besides the design, the biggest area of difference with all these lenses is definitely image stabilization. With Nikon being kind of class leading across the board, offering very nice and smooth image stabilization, you can easily do handheld video as well, closely followed by Canon and then Sony. And this is one area where Sony has struggled the most in my opinion. It has gotten better with the releases of the latest cameras like the A9 Mark III, where image stabilization and IBIS has definitely improved. But Canon and Nikon are definitely leading the way when it comes to the combination of the image stabilization and the IBIS and how smooth that is and having the ability to do handheld video with relative ease. With Sony, you can do that as well, especially on a camera like the A9 Mark III, we can have dynamic active image stabilization, but then at the same time, that crops heavily into your video. So there's definitely an improvement there for Sony, but overall, Canon and Nikon are definitely better when it comes to the image stabilization and would be my preferred brands, especially if I plan to do a lot of handheld video. For photos, I found the image stabilization, all three of these lenses fairly good and had no real concerns. Where it really sets it apart is when it comes to video. And the Canon 200 to 800 millimeter lens actually has kind of a strange behavior sometimes when it comes to image stabilization in video mode where it just seems to shake loose and you just can't get any smooth footage. And then you need to kind of shake the lens a little bit or give it a little slap and then it will kind of lock into place and you can do handheld video fairly easily as well. So when it comes to the image stabilization, I would say Nikon closely followed by Canon and then Sony. When it comes to the image quality, all three of these lenses are excellent and the differences between these lenses are fairly marginal and other factors in the field like heat haze for instance, probably influence your results more than the differences between these three lenses. In my tests, all three of these lenses are nice and sharp and deliver great results, especially if you're quite close to your subject. Naturally, the further away from your subject, the more kind of dirty air will be between you and your subject and the more image quality will also suffer. What I noticed with both the Nikon and Canon lenses is that they benefit a little bit from stopping down on the long end. And both of these lenses are also slightly sharper zoomed out. So for instance, the Canon lens is a little bit sharper at 600mm than it is fully zoomed out at the 800mm mark. Now, none of these lenses is not sharp on the long end, but there's definitely a slight increase in sharpness when you stop down or zoom out slightly. Ultimately, the image quality, especially for the price point, is very good and definitely doesn't leave much to be desired in the field. Of course, compared to a very expensive f4 600mm prime lens, for instance, you will see differences in sharpness and to fine detail. But for what these lenses are, I think the image quality is excellent. And I've never not grabbed one of these lenses because I was concerned that I wouldn't get like a nice and sharp photo. So image quality, while it is better with the top of the line lenses, is definitely not a huge area of concern and you can get excellent results with all three of these lenses. Image quality is also still quite good with the teleconverters on these lenses and I've gotten excellent results with all three of them. The Nikon and Sony lenses are then wide open at 840mm and f9 and the Canon lens is wide open at 1120mm and f13. So you're definitely starting to struggle when you're doing low light photography but in good light I've gotten excellent photos with all three of these lenses and the teleconverters attached. 
The only thing I noticed that with the teleconverter attach, especially that Nikon lens benefits from stopping down slightly more. If you already own a Nikon setup, Canon setup or Sony setup and you just want to add a nice mega zoom to your lineup, sticking to your brand is probably the wisest choice. But if you're switching from a DSLR camera to mirrorless for instance, or you're looking for a new main wide love lens irregardless of brand, the choice definitely isn't an easy one and each of these lenses come with some pros and some cons. Sony and Nikon definitely offer the nicest designs with an easy to reach and relatively short throw zoom ring so it's quite easy to zoom in and out in the field. This is one area where Canon definitely lacks a little bit with the external zoom design and they also have that not removable lens foot. On the other hand, Canon offers you an extra 200 millimeters without having to do anything else to your lens or adding a teleconverter and that's definitely hard to beat. As you know, as wildlife nature and especially bird photographers, size does matter. So having those extra 200 millimeters on the long end is definitely something that makes the Canon lens stand out. And on top of that, you could even add the 1.4 extender and get to 1120 millimeters. And this is something where the other lenses struggle a little bit because to get to even 800 millimeters, you already have to add the 1.4 extender that will add weight and cost to your setup. And if you wanted to actually get to over 1000 millimeters with the Sony or Nikon lens, you'd have to add a two times teleconverter. And this is not really something that I would recommend on a zoom lens. So when it comes to the ultimate reach, Canon definitely has the edge. But what good is the lens without a camera? So this is another cost factor we have to consider in our setup. And this is one area where Canon probably has the most attractive options at the moment, at least when it comes to price, because we have the R7 and R8, both priced at 1500 US dollars and with fairly capable autofocusing capabilities. So you can get a fabulous wildlife setup of the 200 to 800 millimeter lens and the R7 or the R8 for under 3500 US dollars. For Sony, for instance, you could get the A7 IV with the 200 to 600 millimeter lens and the 1.4 teleconverter to also get you to 800 millimeters. And then you're roughly looking at one to two thousand dollars more than the Canon setup. When it comes to Nikon, even though the lens is the cheapest, we probably end up with the most expensive setup because the only two cameras I could really recommend because they have the best autofocusing abilities would be the Z8 and the Z9. The other cameras are good, but they definitely lag behind in terms of autofocusing capabilities compared to Sony and Canon. So until we have a Z6 Mark III down the track, with the Nikon combo will be the most expensive because we have to have the cheap lens, but then add about $4,000 or $3,800 for a Z8, and then also add the teleconverter. So overall, that combo will probably come out the most expensive. Now this will change down the track with probably Sony and Nikon having cheaper and more capable cameras. But for now, I see a small edge there with Canon because they have those well-priced cameras and also have a well-priced lens that gives you an extra reach so you don't have to necessarily buy a teleconverter. And if you want to spend a little bit more, you could also get the highly capable R6 Mark II and paired with that 200 mm lens. Of course, price isn't everything and you also have to pick the brand. We just like the overall feel of the lens and the camera the best and find the camera that you like the most in the field. And you might already own one of these cameras already and then just adding a lens makes it a lot easier and a lot cheaper, of course. Which one of these lenses is the best one for you or for me for that matter? It's actually quite hard to say because you have to decide which brand you like first, most of all. But then also, do you prefer an external zoom design like the Canon lens where you have an extra 200 millimeters? Or do you prefer the internal zoom design of Sony and Nikon where you then have to add a teleconverter to actually get to that 800 millimeter mark? And what lenses and cameras you want to use alongside these mega zooms also plays a crucial role in finding the right lens and brand for you. Which one is the right one for you? Or do you already own one? Are you planning to buy one? Make sure to share your experiences with me in the comments. Hit that like button, check out my channel membership and hit that subscribe button and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye.